Greetings and welcome to the first lecture on genetics and plant breeding. In this lecture, I will introduce you to some of the fundamental concepts and terminologies associated with breeding and also introduce you to some of the developments in plant breeding from a historical perspective. What exactly is breeding and why do we breed plants? Well, one of the reasons is we are trying to improve species so that we can exploit them for our commercial benefit. Now, in order to breed plants, we have to understand the fundamentals in terms of the genetics. The early breeders were not aware of these concepts of genetics, but as science has progressed, we have an increasing amount of knowledge related to the genetics of plants. Now, we know that genetics forms the basis of life and that genes regulate everything from phenotypes of plants as well as behavior in higher species. When we look at genetics and breeding from the perspective of forestry, forests are an invaluable genetic resource. This is because they have evolved for millennia in isolation and forests contain a diversity of genes. However, because of anthropogenic effects such as deforestation and climate change, there is a significant loss of species diversity, which in turn will affect our survival as a species. This is why we need to conserve forests as a living gene bank. The theories of modern genetics were prevalent in the early 1600s and in the 17th century. William Harvey was a physiologist. He was studying and he is well known for documenting the circulatory system in the human body. And he is the one who proposed the theory of epigenesis. Now you must be aware of the fact that at that point in time, Nobody was aware of the concepts of genes and chromosomes. All they were aware of was hereditary and traits. They were not aware of the genetic basis for these traits. Then there was the theory of preformation, which means that essentially the egg contains a small miniature human being who then develops. Today we know that this is not true because as the human body develops in the womb, it's actually undergoing cell differentiation. In fact, all organisms undergo differentiation at the cellular stage. It's not a miniature organism which exists at the cellular level. <laughs> then in the 1830s, the cell theory was proposed because scientists observed through the microscopy that tissues actually were composed of small cells. However, they were not aware of the components of the cell. They could just visualize components in terms of the cellular diversity. Okay, so they observed different kinds of cells and they proposed the cell theory. Then in the 19th century, there was a theory proposed regarding the fixity of species, which means that everything is created once and remains unchanged. Now, these were various theories which were challenged during that period in time. Then came Charles Darwin and he asked questions. He visited an, uh, an island in the Galapagos region that's in the Pacific Ocean. It's just off the coast of South America. And he observed in a single island ecosystem a diversity of peak types in birds. These are finches. So they are Galapagos Island finches. Now, this is an island ecosystem in which the finches have evolved in isolation, but still they have diversity. So he proposed a theory stating that these birds evolved their beaks in response to the diversity of seeds. So the, the bird number one, which is Diospiza magnerisotris, had a large beak because it fed on the larger seeds and required more strength to break the seeds. Whereas the species number four had a smaller beak because it relied on certain seeds which was smaller and did not require to be cracked open. So based on the beak types and observations, he proposed the theory of evolution based on 
environmental selection. Now, Charles Darwin proposed the origin of species. Not everyone agrees with him. Even till today, there has been a lot of controversy with regard to the theories of evolution. But he had a colleague called Alfred Russell Wallace, and he proposed another theory, which is the theory of natural selection. If you are interested in studying the history of natural selection, you should know that Wallace actually proposed a line which passes through the Indonesian archipelago. So on one side of the line, which is the Australian side, the species are distinct. And on the other side, the species are more related to the Asian origin of species. So you have a distinct line which passes through the Papua New Guinea region, and then you get a diversity of species. So Wallace traveled across Southeast Asia, and he proposed this theory of natural selection. Now, what he proposed was the environment was a source of variation. So that means various temperature regimens or the different kinds of climates led to the origin of new species. He And Charles Darwin also proposed what is known as the survival of the fittest, which means that the species keep evolving and they develop traits and eventually they become distinct species and they cannot hybridize or mate with their counterparts who do not have those traits. And this results in the creation of subspecies and what we call reproductive isolation. So these were theories which they have developed based on observations. So both Charles Darwin and Wallace were observers. They observed phenomenon and they asked questions and then they fitted it within a preconceived design and they proposed these theories of evolution. This was all happening simultaneously when suddenly Mendel, who was actually a monk, he was living in a monastery and he started working on plants. Okay, so he proposed a theory of heredity and inheritance. Now what Mendel observed was when he was working with plants, when he cross-spread plants using different types of crosses such as the monohybrid, dry hybrid and tri hybrid crosses, there was an inheritance pattern but it was not according to what was predicted. So he observed there were variations in the patterns of inheritance. He wrote a theory, he published a paper actually, and this paper was uh, debated upon and largely lost to science until Hugo de Vires, who was from the Netherlands and other researchers from Germany and Austria re-explored his work. They reproduced his work and then they found out things which were unique and they confirmed his theories of heredity, inheritance, and the traits, phenotypes, and genotypes. Now, William Bateson is the one who coined the term genetics. He's a British scientist, and he promoted the Mendel's view of paired genes that control different traits. Earlier, it was assumed that the phenotypical traits were related to some component, but you must be aware again, at that point, people do not know about DNA, they don't know about genes. They can only speculate that there's a certain trait and it's associated with something, but they still don't know what that thing is. There's still a large question. So they propose these units of heredity. Now, this is a picture of Drosophila melanogaster. It's actually a fruit fly, which is very common. You'll find it on all fruits. And this fruit fly has served as a model for the identification of the chromosomes. Now, Thomas Hunt Morgan was a researcher and he was observing these chromosomes from the salivary gland of the fruit fly, which are very large. They are polythene chromosomes and he stained them and he was observed that they had a stain, a bending pattern. At that time, he was not aware of what this bending pattern actually represents, but he conducted multiple experiments with Drosophila and he was able to identify the genes which are linked to the gender or the sex chromosomes. So he proposed these theories of autosomes and the sex chromosomes. So Thomas Hunt Morgan made a big contribution to genetics by using a very simple model organisms. 
and they developed the theory of a gene as a distinct or discrete unit on a chromosome. So they said there is a chromosome, but there's something on the chromosome which is coding a specific trait. So by doing certain experiments, they were able to prove that that something or that gene, which at that time was unknown, was actually encoding for certain traits. So now we come down to the level of the gene. And there was a researcher called Archipel Garrod who was studying a metabolic disorder which is called alkaptonuria. This is actually a metabolic disorder which causes a change in the color of the urine and it's a very rare disorder. What he found out from biochemical studies was that this disorder was linked to a single enzyme. Okay, an enzyme is a protein which catalyzes a certain process. But at that time, again, researchers were not able to link that particular enzyme or that protein to again to a genetic element. Then Beadle and Tatum actually proposed a theory of one gene and one enzyme, which means that they said that every enzyme in the body or every protein in the body, right from the proteins which make up your eyes to your skin to other structural elements of your body, as well as the enzymes, are all encoded by genes. And they propose that each gene encodes a single enzyme and that one gene translates into a single polypeptide. So, for example, in our human genome, we have about 20,000 coding genes and they all encode different enzymes as well as other structural elements. Now we go to the next level. From genes came the theory of DNA. So, Watson and Crick uh, working on a structure, a proposed structure of DNA. So they used the pictures from X-ray diffraction, which was from Wilkins, and they proposed a structure for DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid. Again, at that time, no one knew what that DNA encodes for. Another team of researchers comprising Hargobin Korana, Marshall Nirenberg, and Robert Hawley, identified the genetic code. So earlier, people did not know what that A, T, C, and G in the DNA actually represents. But the work of Hargobin Korana led to the discovery of the triplet, which codes for amino acids. So, for example, A, T, G in the DNA encodes methionine. So this was the work done by Hargobin Korana, which proved the entire coding structure of DNA. And once they did that, they understood the language of DNA and they opened up the door for genetic engineering. Now, Thomas Hunt Morgan and his work on fruit fly, he had identified chromosomes and banding patterns. But today, with the advances of genetics, plant species, commercial crops, the human genome, and many of the animal species which are used for commercial use, such as chickens and cows. We have an extensive set of chromosome maps, and these chromosome maps underlie or define the structure of the chromosome, and they can be used to specifically locate genes within the chromosome. And by studying what is known as linkage maps, we can identify what happens when chromosomes cross over and there is homologous recombination. So this is human chromosome 14, and you can see the variation in the chromosome. And those P and Q are the arms. So you see P on top and Q below, and these are the two arms. So when we map genes to chromosomes, we have to map them using a specific set of numbers. So now people had the general picture. So we knew there was DNA, and there was the discovery of RNA, and there was protein. So there was a correlation between these three. So we knew that DNA gets transcribed to RNA, and then it is translated into protein. With this knowledge, it became possible to understand genetics and carry out experiments which were related to
breeding, selection, as well as genetic engineering. Now, every gene encodes different elements. Some of the genes get transcribed into RNA, but they are not translated into protein. They form part of a regulatory network. But some of the genes do get translated into proteins. Now, one of the examples of protein in the plant kingdom is rubisco. If the structure of the rubisco protein was altered significantly, we won't have the process of photosynthesis. So this is a critical protein, and it's one of the most widely distributed proteins in terms of abundance across the planet. Everything from algae to plants contain some version of rubisco. Now, if there was an alteration or a mutation in the rubisco protein, it will influence the phenotype and the protein will be non-functional. So protein structure and function is related to mutation. And mutations can adversely affect proteins. Proteins are synthesized via a cellular machinery, which is based on the ribosome. So when you have a messenger RNA transcript, this messenger RNA transcript is read by the ribosome. And it combines with the transfer RNAs to produce the polypeptide chain. Now, any mutation in the DNA is transferred to the RNA. And if there is a mutation, it can lead to a nonsense protein. Nonsense in a, in the, means that that protein does not necessarily translate into a functional protein, or that protein may have some kind of defect which will alter its activity. This is why understanding the concept of genes and alleles is very important. Now, when a protein is not translated correctly, it can become lethal to the organism itself. With this knowledge of genetics, transcriptomics, which is the RNA, and the proteome, scientists could now carry out genetic engineering. So genetic engineering involves the introduction of genes directly into a plant tissue. For example, plant cells can be isolated. A gene can be inserted using a DNA-based vector system. And this vector can be based on agrobacterium, which is a bacterium, or even cauliflower mosaic virus or tobacco mosaic virus. So these vectors carry genes into the plant cells. Once the genes have been introduced into the plant cells, they will carry certain traits. Now, genetic engineering bypasses the traditional breeding by hybridization because it involves the direct introduction of genes from different species into a plant. You can introduce, for instance, a bacterial gene into a plant or even a human gene into a plant and the plant will express that particular gene once it grows up. Now, this has formed the basis of the modern biotechnology industry. So this is a picture of the callous cells carrying the particular gene. Now, once the plants have been transformed with the gene, they can be selected using a specific medium. And once you obtain these clones, they can be propagated clonally. So this is the, some of the terminologies which you should be aware of. So deoxyribonucleic acid is the DNA. Genes are units on the DNA. So genes are generally referred to as features. Alleles are variants of a single gene. So a single gene may carry multiple alleles. And these alleles may be expressed either in a co-dominant or dominant fashion. Some alleles are recessive and they will only express under certain conditions. Then we have the ribonucleic acid or the RNA. So deoxyribonucleic acid DNA gets transcribed into RNA. 
and that RNA in turn gets translated into proteins. So be careful when you use the words transcribed and translated as they relate to a specific process. Now the, some of the other terms are the chromosomes themselves. Chromosomes contain genes which are arranged on a scaffold and these chromosomes undergo a process known as recombination and they are carrying the traits from the parents to the progeny. Then we have hereditary, which is the inheritance of traits. Traits relate to specific phenotypical features which you can identify either visually or by using other means. Now, in the classical breeding, traits are generally referred to as phenotypes or phenotypical traits. In molecular breeding, we refer to the genotype. Epigenetics relates to the modifications of DNA which are inherited. Okay, so there is a process known as DNA methylation which switches off certain genes and now there has been a significant amount of research related to epigenetics which has identified the epigenome or methylated genome and this is primarily influenced by the environment. So the environment leads to the process of methylation of the genome. During methylation, certain genes are switched on and switched off. And now there's a significant amount of evidence which says that this epigenetics contributes to the inheritance of certain traits. And these traits can be transferred from the parents to the progeny. So epigenetics is a emerging field of research in genetics. So whatever we learn during these lectures, we have to apply to our field, which is tropical forest genetics. And we face multiple challenges when we work within a tropical forest ecosystem. For instance, when you look at a tropical system or a forest ecosystem, the first thing you notice is diversity. You will not have one species of trees, for example, a hundred trees located in one location and then you move on and there's a thousand trees located in another location. Generally, because of seed dispersal by animals, by the wind, by water, you will have these trees spread across a large region. So you may have a single forest and then you'll have 1,000 species maybe distributed over 1,000 square kilometers of forested area. Now this leads to a problem because there can be no breeding between the trees because of the physical barriers. There's distance, for instance, you may need bats to pollinate, you may need insects to pollinate. So if there's no pollination, there'll be no exchange of genetic material and these trees will remain isolated. So this is one of the challenges which you will face when you try to conduct a natural breeding in the forest. And this is exactly the reason why we have to carry out an intervention by doing artificial breeding. Now the complexity of the forest ecosystem is something which you need to understand because for instance, pollination in natural circumstances is restricted to specific species. For example, we all know, and it's common knowledge that durian is, requires bats for pollination. So in the absence of bats, it may require a human intervention. So each trees of, or each forest species has its own specific kind of intervention, which is necessary. This makes tropical forest genetics and breeding challenging. Now there have been several success stories in plant breeding as far as forest trees are concerned. Acacia is very well documented, eucalyptus as well because of their commercial value. Then we have teak, Tectona grandis, and there have been several farms which cultivate these trees in the form of silviculture for forestry and exploitation. However, Tectona grandis, as you know, has a very long life cycle. It may require 60 years to reach the commercially viable size. And then we have rubber, 
Hevia brasiliensis, which is very common in Malaysia. So there has been a lot of work on rubber because the genome has been sequenced and varieties have been selected on the basis of disease tolerance as well as on the quality of the latex which is produced. So these are some species for which significant amount of research has been done and the results have led to some commercial gains. Now when we look at breeding, we have to look at the concept of diversity. Where did all these original species come from? So today we have limited forests across the world and the forest cover is declining. But there was a point in time when the earth had a significant amount of area under forest cover. And this led to the concept of diversity in the ancient world. However, when human beings first began to exploit uh, trees and plants for developing new varieties, there were certain centers of diversity. The Russian scientist Vavilov investigated this. He was a plant botanist and he was a keen observer of the diversity of species. So he observed that there were distinct areas in which diversity was developed by humans. And among these, we had South America and Central America. So if you look at potatoes, tomatoes, maize, okay, you will notice that their origin is South America. Then we had the Asian regions in which the primary emphasis was the development of rice. And then you had Africa, the sub-Saharan Africa, Eritrean regions, what is today Ethiopia and Somalia. They also had their own crops which they developed. So each region of the world had its own crop system based on their agroclimatic conditions. But today's world, we have trading. So you see diversity of crops. For example, wheat is grown all across the world and rice is grown almost all across the world and maize. So these are diversified across the world. And today's uh, crops are mainly monoculture, which means they have been de derived from a purebred line for commercial reasons. So Vavilov was one of the first scientists who studied this diversity. Now, the tragedy of Vavilov is that he was imprisoned because he challenged some of the Russian scientists during the Soviet era. So he was imprisoned and he sadly died in prison. He was one of the first scientists who established a seed bank in Russia during the German occupation of World War II. There was a seed bank and the scientists who were looking after that seed bank actually died of starvation because they refused to eat the seeds. They wanted to protect the seeds during the war for future generations. So eight of them actually died of starvation. So this is the level of dedication uh, which these researchers had for conservation. Now, we are moving on to what is known as breeding. Breeding can take place naturally. You can have what are known as indeterminate hybrids. So you just plant rows of vegetables or rows of corn of different varieties and the breeding will take place naturally based on the environmental conditions, the presence of pollinators, etc. But what we do as breeders is we try to select plants based on certain phenotypes and genotypes. And the aim of breeding is generally to improve the productivity. For instance, farmers or breeders will look for plants which have a good response to fertilizer. They don't want to waste fertilizer. So they want to have a plant which responds to small amounts of fertilizer. So they look for that. Secondly, you look for plants which will give high yields, obviously, resistance to disease and uniformity. Uniformity means you can uh, harvest the crop at the same time. In the case of a forest tree species, you can harvest it at the same time and you'll get a tree with approximately the same amount of wood and the same dimensions. So this is important from the breeder's perspective. Now, ever since Mendel discovered this theory of breeding, his laws were used for plant breeding. And many companies were established in the European countries for the development of novel plant varieties. So there is a certain terminology associated with breeding such as pure line selection, which means the selection of plants based on the uh, 
pure variety. So you have a pure plant and a pure variety. The disadvantage of having pure lines is that if you breed them or inbreed them too often, you may have disease because they are they don't have resistance. Then we have hybridization, in which case we cross two varieties of plants or even maybe two species to create a new species. We have polyploidy and we have mutation. So these are all the different kinds of breeding approaches which we undertake and which we will study in detail during future lectures. Breeding actually commences with the realization amongst agronomists in the ancient world that they cannot rely on hunter-gatherer systems. So they decide to settle in a place and they start cultivating. So this can be observed in the Aztec, Mayan and Incan civilizations in South America. So what they did is they bred corn. In fact, the Aztecs had a corn god, a god whom they worshipped who represented corn. So that's the level of importance they gave to the plant. And they even had animal sacrifices and human sacrifices to appease the corn god. So they had a lot of social and cultural associations with breeding. So men started to breed plants by observing the breeding patterns in nature. In fact, corn is developed from teosinte. It's actually a grass. So the South Americans civilizations developed this from successive breeding cycles. So they learned, they figured it out, even though they didn't know the science and the genetics, they figured out the basis for breeding. But in the French companies in the 1700s, they began to establish commercial breeding farms. Now, most of the European uh, breeding companies or what was established in Europe was based on colonization. So they had colonized Asia and they probably took away a lot of species from Asia, took them to Europe, they developed their own breeds and then they sold them back to Asian countries in the current uh, era. So that's what has been, happen or been happening all over the world and still happening today. So it's an exploitation of the process, but that is another level that's basically involves economics. But what was observed in plants was sexual dimorphism. So they were, wherever there is, for instance, sexual dimorphism means you have a male and species, uh, female, which is distinct in a specific species, you can uh, do hybridization. So there were var variations which were developed, a variants of wheat, variants of the peas and other plants in the 17th century, people began to experiment because they knew that by hybridizing, they could develop new varieties and they could be commercialized. Now in the post Mendel era, we moved from phenotypes to genotypes. So in the early days, we just observe a plant, oh, this plant is good and that plant is bad. It does not yield. So we cross it over and we take all the good plants, we cross them over and we develop a new hybrid. Okay. But there are other factors which intervene. So in the post Mendel era, researchers and breeders moved into molecular breeding. So they moved from the phenotype to the genotype because now we had information on the genome, on the DNA and the genes, and we knew which genes could be linked to which traits. Researchers began to focus on different things. They focused on, for example, the genotype and the environment. The environment influences many aspects of plant life. For example, flowering in temperate species is influenced by the light. So in the tropical countries, the light is almost similar. We have 12 hours of to 16 hours of daylight and then the remaining hours of darkness. But in the tropical countries and the temperate countries, there's a difference in the light variation. So in the temperate countries during winter, you have less light. So that basically sets for the biological clock and it induces flowering and other aspects of plant growth and development. For instance, uh, apple trees undergo a process known as vernalization. So in winter, they shed their leaves and then in spring, the fruits break out, the flowers and the fruiting takes place and that is influenced by the cold. So they need to go through that cold cycle to the process of vernalization. So this is the influence of the environment on the genome. Now, because we understood the genome, we could 
figure out the way to use the genome. That means if you increase, for example, ploidy, increase the number of chromosomes, you would have a different kind of plant because the gene dosage would increase. Okay. But what really led to the breakthrough is genome sequencing. Now, the first tree which was sequenced fully was populous. So they sequenced the entire genome and scientists were able to pinpoint certain traits such as the wood quality, the growth characteristics of popla to specific genes. Okay, and this can lead to new interventions. Currently, a large number of plant genomes have been sequenced. And the rubber tree, for example, you have the genome and you can do almost all interventions using genetic engineering. Now, what we look for as breeders is variation. We cannot breed a plant if it has no variation. So we look for variation when we want to do a breeding experiment. So the basis for breeding is variation. Now, when you have variation, you can combine these. You can mate them and you can produce a population. So this population will have an entirely new set of genes, which are a combination of the genes from the two parental genotypes. Now, what has happened with modern plants or even modern trees is that most of them are derived from monoculture, which means the best of the variants are combined, selected, screened, and then they are clonally propagated. So you get monoculture. The advantage of monoculture is you get uniformity. For example, you grow a tree from a clonal hybrid, you will have a tree in 10 years time, the entire forest will have the same trees which you can harvest at the same time. If you have variation, you may harvest the first tree maybe in 10 years, maybe the second tree will harvest after 20 years and that's not good for the economics of forestry. So the basis for selection is uniformity. However, uniformity has its issues and problems because when you have a uniform population, if you have, for instance, a fungal infection on one tree, that fungal infection will definitely be transmitted to all the trees and you'll have a mass mortality. So farmers used to select earlier based on the observation. Our ancestors selected plants based on observation. So they bred it by observation, but now selection is done based on genetics. One of the classical examples of polyploidy is a vegetable which you consume almost every day. Okay, so you have brassica. So what we call savi or the uh, bok choy and the cabbage kubis. These are actually all from the same family brassica. But as you can see in this diagram over here, the chromosome number is different. So just by altering the chromosome number, you can change the entire morphology of the plant and even the appearance is different. Okay, so you have Brassica ulericea and then it's a, it has nine and then you have 19 chromosomes. So Brassica napus and you have Brassica rapa, Brassica juncia, all of them have a different chromosome number, but the genes or the collection of genes is the same. It's just the chromosome number which is different. Now, how do you induce a plant to become polyploid? There are multiple methods. One of them is to use a chemical compound. So you use chemical compounds which lead to polyploidy. And when you have a polyploid, you will have variation in the phenotype. So a large number of commercially derived plants which we consume today, the vegetables, are actually polyploids. Now, the reason why you have changes in the phenotype is because when you have more chromosomes, you have more copy numbers of certain genes and they'll produce more proteins, which will cause a change in the structure. So that's a generally accepted idea with regard to polyploids. So we have covered up some of the basic terminologies. We will look at some of the terminologies which we will be covering in future lectures. The first terminology is the breeding system. So breeding system is a term which is used to cover all those variables apart from mutation which affect the genetic relation of the gametes that fuse in sexual reproduction. This is related to hybridization. The next term which you will come across is clone. Now a clone simply means 
that it's a population of cells, organisms derived from a single cell by mitosis. For example, for us, for human beings, an identical twin will be a clone. Okay, So they are identical genetically, completely. So that's a clone. In breeding terminology, a clone means I take a single plant and then I propagate it either using vegetative cutting. So it becomes a clone. It has no genetic variation. It just has the original parental genotype with no uh, variation caused by hybridization. Now the next term is classical breeding. So in classical breeding, we refer to the conventional term. We have variety one. I take the pollen from variety one. I transfer it to variety two onto the flower. And there is fertilization, cross breeding, and then I select the seeds and look for variation. So this is the classical breeding. Okay. So we can do uh, classical breeding using hybridization as well as polyploidy, which is using a chemical to increase the chromosome number. And we can also do what is known as mutation using chemical methods. So these all form fall into the domain of classical breeding. We call it classical because we do not have much control over the process of gene expression and the process of gene rearrangement. Now, when we do any form of breeding, we can develop what is known as a pure line. So pure line means we know the two parental genotypes. We determine the two parental genotypes or maybe multiple parental genotypes. And then we develop one variety, which is a pure line. And everything else is a clone of this pure line. So that's a inbred or the pure line. Now, in hybrid breeding or hybridization, we cross two species. There may be two species or maybe two varieties. So we take two plants with different traits and we cross them over. Now, you will be surprised to learn there is actually a pomato, which is a cross between a potato and a tomato. People have tried all these things. So they have created these hybrids, but most of them are not commercially viable. So the idea of hybridization, for example, with tomato and potato was to have a plant which had tomatoes growing on the top and potatoes at the roots. So you could get two in one. But these ideas are not really commercially viable because there are other problems associated with crossing different species. But hybrid breeding is also very useful for the development of new plants. Then we have heterosis. So most of the hybridization is done with the assumption that when we cross two different varieties, we will obtain a variety which is better. But this may not be the case in every experiment. But heterosis is the basis for that because the concept which has been so hardwired into a breeder's mind is that when you cross something which is good, you may get something better. So you have two varieties which are good. You will get a third variety or the progeny which is far better. And then we have the mutation. So mutation means either using a chemical or a radiological, a radioactive ionizing radiation to change the structure of the DNA so that the proteins change and they will produce a plant which is slightly different. So these are some of the terminologies which you should be aware of and which I'm going to introduce to you very slowly so that you can grasp their meaning. We will introduce you to new terminologies as the lectures progress. Okay, so with that, we come to the end of this first lecture. I will briefly summarize what we have learned, or what we have studied today. So in this lecture, we have looked at the basis for breeding. And the entire basis for breeding is genes. Okay? Genes form the basis for breeding. And understanding the way in which genes interact give the breeder a better perspective or better understanding of how to develop new and novel hybrids. The reason why we are applying breeding to our particular subject, in this case, which is forest tree species, is because we are trying to develop new species or novel variants with specific traits that are amenable to agroforestry. And the reason why this does not occur in the forest naturally is because these varieties or these different trees have uh, diversified or geographically dispersed and the chances of pollination and cross fertilization are very low. So this is where we do 
who have to carry out an intervention in order to exploit the genetic diversity. Now, what forms the basis of genetic diversity? We can look at the genome structure itself and select populations based on population diversity and then hybridize them to develop new varieties. Once we develop new varieties, we can propagate them clonally in tissue culture systems and we can use them as the basis for commercial plantation. So these are some of the ideas which I have discussed today. We have also looked at the historical development of the genome itself and the ideas of genetics and breeding with the work done by Mendel, Darwin and the other researchers. So this is the context of the current lecture. In the next lecture, we will be studying the principles associated with mitosis and meiosis. So thank you very much for your attention to this lecture. You can reference this lecture at any time for your revision. And if you have any questions, please post them in the forums section in this particular week at the UMS Smart V3. Thank you very much.